Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Division of Information Technologies weekly webinar series. I am Lauren Niemeyer, the Web 2.0 Specialist in the Learning Technologies Group, and today we are joined by Amy Ginther, Coordinator of Project Nexus in the Division of Information Technology. She'll be talking to us today on copyright and intellectual property issues in the digital environment. So if you have any questions throughout, please feel free to type them in the chat area on the lower left-hand side of your screen, or raise your hand and um, we can call on you to talk as well. So um, take it away, Amy. Thanks, Lauren. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. And uh, today, as Lauren said, we're going to talk about copyright. And I'm going to um, rely on a set of slides that I want to give appropriate attribution for right away. Um, Ann Bowden of our the University of Maryland's uh, Office of Legal Affairs has been very instrumental in um, uh, the education that we do out into our community, um, various colleges and web developers um, on this topic. And so I write on her expertise um, in many ways to uh, put this material together. And I see that uh, we have some folks from the University of Pittsburgh uh, around uh, today. So um, that is a their Anne's contact information as an expert is at the end, and I join her and in, um, in trying to respond to questions people have at the university and um, in, in answering these interesting questions that come up in this area. Um, I'm not formally trained, um, but uh, certainly have uh, a lot of uh, activity in fielding these kinds of questions. So I think it's important to have us understand, you know, why we do want to be reaching out and understanding the basics of, of the copyright issues. And in a higher education environment, I think the most basic thing is that there's an importance of respecting the um, in the intellectual property and protecting that incentive to create new knowledge. And so to be good role models about this as we develop web uh, presence and, and for students, um, it's important to ask permissions for when we want to use something that is not under a fair use uh, um, purview, um, but at least being able to defend why we might have used something. There is some organizational liability, um, although I can say to build confidence with you users out there that we've, I've never known of a case of uh, litigation with the university being, uh, you know, ha having done something wrong. So um, we have checks and balances when information goes online that um, isn't ours to use, and that is that a copyright agent for the university receives notices of copyright infringed works and then we bring that material down off the network. So that's how we are protecting um, the university's interests and I'm that person. So uh, we receive, most often we receive those uh, with respect to the students' use of the network for their acquisition of their digital entertainment media. Uh, movies and games and music, uh, but then there are some other interesting kinds of things sometimes that make it into web pages that students are hosting on the Terp Connect interface. Um, so we do have ways of, of making corrections if something is posted that isn't uh, up, uh, under permission. And so I think a check is to be familiar with your organization's acceptable use policy and uh, and, and other policies that may uh, be involved. And so let me go through a few kinds of high points of what is in the University of Maryland's acceptable use policy. Really, a uh, primary principles section on, um, on the freedoms that we have that are uh, absolutely the core of our academic mission, um, but also the need to uh, use those freedoms responsibly. Um, we talk about uh, the use of the technology is to 
academic and teaching and learning missions and administrative missions of the university or the administrative objectives um, and the importances of security and privacy uh, that we that are all blended. So uh, privacy isn't an absolute, and sometimes we need for security reasons to um, uh, to look at what. Uh, behavior may have happened online, um, but that, that's, those are all components that we're balancing. Um, pro prohibited conduct, uh, one of which is copyright infringement, is detailed in the acceptable use policy, and then some other kinds of things about how the policy is um, is is administered. So those are going to be present in any kind of work environment, um, and it's good to start there and know. Uh, where um, what those uh, overlying uh, expectations are. Um, for today, we're going to focus on intellectual property um, and specifically on copyright, but it, it is under an umbrella of a number of different things. And sometimes trademarks and, and registered marks and service marks bleed into this topic. So there may be um, questions that come up that we handle, um, uh, that we may be uh, uh, consulted upon there too. Uh, but today we're going to uh, focus on copyright. And I'm trying to adjust my slide here a little bit, Lauren, if I can get the bottom of that just so that throughout I make sure that I'm getting all my notes. Um, so uh, the yeah I, think that, I just had trouble dragging. That's okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, copyright is. Um, I'm going to the. Trying to click on. Okay. So it is a number of rights that are uh, granted to the author or creator of an of a or publisher if that right has. that are fixed into a tangible medium. So if you ask the question, is it copyrighted, the notion is that if, it's, if notes have been written down on a page, if an outline is in a document that's been shared, if a recording is, has been taped uh, or digitized, then we have uh, something that's fixed into a tangible media, medium, an image um, in a photo. Um, so that gives the creator the right to reproduce, to make derivative works from it, to distribute that, um, to publicly display and perform as in uh, choreography um, or music, and to perform sound recordings or transmit those sound recordings. So those are the very basic notions of what is copyrightable. And so then we have to ask ourselves uh, going forward, which we'll get to in a little bit, almost everything is copyrighted. So then how do I use it appropriately? And we will get there. But just a few more things on copyright based on uh, what is copyrightable. Um, so it is whether or not they contain a copyright notice and whether or not they've been formally formally registered. Um, there are things that are not copyrightable and then that's important to know that those are things that you f can be freely used without kind of a, a thoughtful process. Um, so works of the U.S. government, works the author has expressly placed in the public domain without limitations, maybe before uh, they go into the public domain, um, facts, forms, ideas, uh, you know, uh, sort of things that are so commonly known that they aren't copyrightable, and a spontaneous unrecorded speech. So my speaking today, if we're making a recording of it, um, it's, well, it is being recorded, but as I'm giving it, it's really not. I mean, if I would be giving this in, into a presentation, I wouldn't claim copyright on that. Although the slides would be something that um, we would, I would, I could claim copyright on. Although I would make these available to anyone who wanted to make use of them. Um, now, the other thing that is not copyrightable is that isn't mentioned here really is maybe we get to it in another slide is things that have already. Uh, gone into the public domain. And yeah, I think we're going to get there in, in a minute. Um, but the other thing to mention is that a notice is not required. And I mentioned that in that previous slide, but um, it, it is useful and it's helpful for communicating 
uh, intentions about uh, copyright or, or giving a reminder, but it is not required. Uh, it, all that needs to happen is that that piece is fixed in a tangible medium. Um, but we can, by using a notice, describe what kind of permission we're comfortable with allowing. So um, per permission for use is granted for nonprofit educational purposes as long as we attribute the source is something that we uh, we do um, kind of use to say, go, go ahead and just give appropriate academic scholarly credit. Um, but when we do need permission um, it is when uh, a, a the copyright is um, uh, it, it, you can you can look when you need to ask permission and rule out when you need permission by looking at a handy uh, Cornell piece which shows when copyright goes into, when a piece goes into the public domain. And we're not going to go to that um, chart, and it is extensive. You really have to situate your piece that you want to use within it because the copyright has shifted from time to time. Um, but that's, when you're not in the public domain is a time when you would uh, seek permission to use another's intellectual property. Um, more importantly for our purposes, I think, or, or often it, we're applying the four factors of fair use. Um, libraries and face-to-face -face teaching online have uses, have, have exceptions, and that's the TEACH Act. Um, but really, I think what's most useful is when in a classroom setting or on a website that's going to be used in an educational manner, um, the application of four factors of fair use is what we want to look at, become familiar with, and um, and defend. And now I'm having a little trouble with this mouse in hitting the right uh uh, uh, back one. I don't know how I blended a couple together here. Um, so the slide is about uh, that's going to come up is about four uh, fair use factors, um, and that is all of these have to be present when we defend a use. One does not trump all the others. So while in most cases our uses in higher education are for nonprofit um, uh, and educational uses, um, that's not enough to say, but I can use it all semester long, the whole amount forever and ever. Other kinds of things need to be balanced out. And so um, the amount of the work used is another uh, the substantial nature of of that in comparison to the whole um, has to be thought about. Are you using the whole work? Are you using a piece of it more appropriate, more defensible to use a smaller portion of it? Um, the characteristics or the nature of the material being used is also a, the essence of the fair use factors. So that um, it's it's when it's more fictional, more creative. It's more protected than if it's an encyclopedic uh, uh, fact, uh, as we would said, that facts uh, aren't as protected. Um, and then the nature or the, uh, the effect of the market value uh, of the original work, the use, of the, mar uh, the use of it, if it's a full use, if it's a lab book that's intended to be consumed uh, class by class, it is uh, not appropriate to give that out to students um, uh, week by week um, and consuming it over the course of the semester. So all of those things need to be present in your decision to use something to, to transmit something. There are some wonderful uh, tools and checklists um, online, and these are uh, some of them um, that uh, can be referred to as you try to sort out whether a use is appropriate or not. And so that's uh, just, those are there for, for you to peruse. Um, and, then, and then there are some more guidelines, and again, uh, my mouse is not quite behaving, and one back, I think, is it one, are there just Sorry, folks, just getting a, oh, no, one forward, okay. Um, 
one thing that um, that has arisen, uh, become available in recent years, when we, uh, in very recently, in the um, when we are um, looking at making decisions about how much to use, how much volume of a piece, um, is that American University Center for Social Media within its School of Communication has done some really exciting work to try to give uh, practitioners, scholars within different disciplines, because these conventions can vary from subject matter to subject matter, uh, guidelines on how much is appropriate to use. Not in a very quantified way, but in a more conceptual, this is the purpose of this material, how can a person use this appropriately, um, uh, and um, so th this is a really rich new kind of ground where we get guidelines about how much we can use um, and, and not run afoul of how this really came out of some experience that um, the creator of this material <clears throat> Sorry, for my voice is going as well on me today. Um, <clears throat> has uh, seen that judges, when things do get litigated, really rely on the expertise of the discipline uh, expert to um, say whether something has uh, uh, been too much of a breach. Um, and so, when so when a use can be thoughtfully defended, the uh, the judges ha have been observed to go with that, go with the experts, and so this is sort of the where this um, came. I just got some feedback. Um, so we can advance to the next slide, and we'll tell you, Tom, I think at the end uh, on how we can get those slides, how, how these can be made available to you. So the American University work is really the uh, new work. Um, these are some other guidelines for educational multimedia, for vis visual media that are available uh, for educational uses of music. want to point out the URL for the Washington.edu piece under educational media. There is very specific uh, quantification guidelines in the fourth section of that piece. Um, that, though, is, we've found, very conservative estimates. So it says things like 10% of an image. So you can only extract a, a piece of an image or 30 seconds of an audio recording. Um, and it doesn't really clarify for us when something is part of a bigger symphony versus a one uh, three minute song, you know, why, where that 30 seconds might differ. So we find, have found, and Ann Bowden, when presenting along with me, has, has said this is very conservative. Um, and while it's helpful at getting started, we find we can use more of that and, and not more than what's quantified in that piece. Um, and so that's where that American piece in the previous slide really came um, came forward as being a more conceptual guidance that you can make uh, thoughtful decisions about. So let's go to the next slide. And I'm watching our time here too because I want to get through the slides and then and and take some questions at the end um, to make sure that that we're you know either if I can't answer them we'll feel I'll field them in some way and 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 happy to get back to people and and consult with Ann Bowden and others and, and get some answers. But so if you have ruled out that you can't, that you are not able to defend a fair use or the piece that you want to use is not in the public domain, then you would go through a permission process. And these couple slides are, um, or couple links are about how you go and research, uh, you know, find the publisher, the copyright owner, um, and, and go through that permission process. Um, it may also just be able to be something you do informally. Um, it might be something that is very clear in the copyright notation, and then just as long as you honor that, that's fine. Or, it, again, it may be something that you ask a colleague at another school about that their web page content is excellent, you don't see a need to reinvent it, but you're going to give attribution as you put it up. And if you get some email in writing even, as simple as that, that will uh, give you the, uh, the appropriate permission. 
Um, we can go to the next one. Um, and there was an, another thing worth mentioning in, in this arena is that um, every, and I'm going to say five years, and I'll have to double check that, but uh, the Copyright Office does review um, the, the copyright law and makes rulings on a periodic basis. And now coming up on two, two summers ago, um, there was a, a really helpful exception or expansion of an exception um, that has now permitted us to um, extract clips from DVDs for use to make compilations of works say for um, a film class or any kind of class to uh, illustrate some sort of theory or concept or, um, uh, you know, uh, critique, uh, a, a, you know, for a journalism class, um, any kinds of uses of, of video that were prohibited to do the de-encryption on um, in years past, it has now been expanded to allow all faculty and students in film and media studies uh, to do these de-encryptions and make these compilations. And I think a student who might say they're in a media study as part of a course, doesn't have to be a media study major, um, can, can do that with, with, in good conscience. And this had previously only been an exception that applied to film scholars, film professors. So that was a nice way. So even um, people out there in the IT world that help faculty in uh, making these compilations can now do this uh, without worry that, that that's a, a rule-breaking kind of thing. It is now a, a permissive use. And um, so, again, these clips, you would make decisions based on, so, uh, um, uh, you know, based on what can be defensible for the use, for the fair use. But um, you wouldn't use a whole, you know, in a compilation like that, you wouldn't use um, a, a third of a movie, but you certainly can use a rich piece of a scene, a full scene, perhaps, to illustrate a point. Um, so let's go to the next slide and uh, just uh, so, some other kinds of things that come up in web development, um, uh, kinds of things that I, I find that questions come up um, that uh, are student contributions to course websites certainly can be a part of what's made available, but students do have the copyright to their original works of creative expression that are fixed in a tangible medium. And so it would be uh, appropriate for faculty to make sure that no one objects a very sensitive piece of uh, some content that was sensitive and they did not want to um, uh, put it out there, that that would be something that um, that was respected, that it just didn't need to be published in that way, or that the student could retain the right to decide when they would have that uh, published. Student images on websites, certainly again with permission, kinds of things that are taken in a public uh, uh, way um, that uh, that that's appropriate to have up as a uh, on a on a you know college or, or departments uh, featuring uh, different uh, activities in the college um, but where uh, an image is obtained and is more um, private uh, maybe in a classroom uh, where the students haven't given permission, that would need to be um, thought of twice, I think, and, and perhaps resisted um, uh, 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 without, unless students have, had given permission. Um, and then uh, rights of publicity. So one does not take um, uh, the, the image of a celebrity that has come to talk to campus um, and, it, and use it on a website just to draw people to that website, unless it was carried as a, a news coverage of a of a college's event. Then it's fine. But if it's um, you know a, a celebrity gives thumbs up to our college and that hasn't been done with permission, that would be a problem. Um, some time ago, we were following some uh, activity around whether 
we needed to seek permission just to link to something. And there was a blip on the screen a number of years ago when NPR decided to require permission before certain websites, any website, would link to of screening who all these requests. And um, it was seen then, and they rethought it as sort of a stifling thing that internet is not meant to be that stifling or that um, uh, restrictive, and, and they did away with that policy. But if there is any kind of statement on a site that says, you know, we, we don't want you to link with us without permission, we should respect that and explore that. And then, um, some uh, notions about just making sure that if you're linking to something that it's uh, still clear uh, where the, that authorship is. Sharing with you some more uh, general purpose uh, websites, uh, all wonderful resources, so much so that we haven't done our own, uh, although we actually now our own is represented, excuse me, by a fine site within our own library. So um, that is there for, for us to um, know as a local site. Um, and then I think our last slide is, is the contact information uh, for legal advice. Uh, for um, consulting in, in an applied manner. Uh, I am often contacted first, and then if, if people out there stump me with real uh, intricate kinds of questions, I rely on, um, on Anne and others to uh, sift through uh, what, what's possible. And, and, um, but as I said, we have the check and the balance of if anything goes up and is published in a way that, uh, we are, uh, that it makes a copyright holder uncomfortable, uh, there is uh, the contact to make, um, and then we would address that and, and notify. So I'm hearing some, is there another question? Um, uh, Every once in a while, there's a tone. So that's the, my planned um, uh, set of um, basics to cover, and am happy to take any questions that are on your minds, or know that uh, again, I'm available offline uh, to answer any any thoughts and questions. And thanks all for your patience as we dealt with the early uh, technical difficulties. It's clapping. That's nice, June. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we'll sign off, and is there may be a local question from Lauren? Okay, yes, we just got, um, We Amy um, has agreed <laughs> to give us permission to post this online, so um, we'll be posting this um, to our site. Um, let me type that, OTAL. otal.umd.edu and backslash copyright, I believe. Um, but if you go to otal.umd.edu and go to, um, on the side we have workshops and events and that's where you probably found the link to today's webinar. So um, we'll post right there along with the recording of this presentation. And thanks everyone so much for um, joining us today and thanks to Amy um, for those great resources and tips. And, um, and please join us next week. Um, we will be talking about unleashing the power of your technology classroom. So how some tips and things that you may not have known that are available to you um, right in your classroom. So thanks, everyone. Oh, intellectual property. Thank you, June. <laughs> All right. Have a great day.